So as the title of our lesson today suggests, uh, we, we are going to look at the restoration of the kingdom. And when I speak of the kingdom, I mean the kingdom of heaven, the restoration of the kingdom of heaven. And I personally feel that this lesson is a very important lesson. And therefore, I, I, I advise those of you who are listening or watching this video uh, to pay a very close attention to what uh, I'm about to share with you. What I intend to do in this lesson is to give a panoramic view of the prophecies of Daniel, uh, only those prophecies dealing with the rise and fall of kingdoms, and how these prophecies tie in uh, with the restoration of the kingdom of heaven. To achieve this goal, what I would do is, I would give a very brief elucidation of uh, Daniel chapter 8, and chapter 11 uh, and and <clears throat> and see how these two chapters when combined with Daniel chap chapters 2 and 7 reveal the truth concerning the restoration of the kingdom so when you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8 you'll find there that Daniel uh, once again uh, receives a vision where he described seeing a two-horned ram and <clears throat> one horn appeared to be longer than the other horn and that the longer horn came up last and as he was considering this ram making its presence and power felt throughout the face of the whole earth Daniel saw a one horn he goat and this he goat came from the west now the he goat never touched the ground and he charged at the ram with uh, such fury and smote it and broke its two horns. Now the he goat became very strong and at the peak of its strength its horn was broken and in its place four horns came up. Uh, the vision also goes on to speak of a fifth horn that came up on the he goat. Now what is the meaning of this? The, the two horned ram represents the kingdom of Medo and Medo Persia and the he goat represents the kingdom of Greece where Alexander was represented by that single horn on the he-goat's head. Now the four horns that appear after the first horn is broken are the four generals of Alexander, uh, namely Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy and Seleucus. These four men divided the kingdom of Alexander into four parts. Now we dealt with this in the f Daniel when we did Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. This interpretation is summed up in the following verses of Daniel chapter 8 where it says The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia and the rough goat is the king of Grecia and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king that is King Alexander. Now that being broken whereas four stood up for it four kings of four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation but not in his power. So these uh, words are very clear. Uh, it immediately we understand that Daniel chapter 8 is self explanatory. So, in Daniel chapter 8, as I said, goes on to speak about the little horn that appeared after the four horns uh, of the goat. Now, this horn represents the ancient Roman Empire. Uh, we can be certain of this from the description of, of the nature and character of this horn. Uh, this is what we read in Daniel chapter 8 verse 11 and 12. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression, and cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So, when this verse tells that this little horn magnified himself even to the prince of hosts, uh, we know for a fact that uh, this is indicative of the fact that this power shall be used uh, to persecute and to seek to destroy the Son of God. In fact, verse 25 clearly says that he shall stand up against the Prince of Princes. Now, the only person, the only being who, who, who is known as the Prince of Princes is Jesus Christ. And this little horn, power of Daniel chapter 8, shall seek to, 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 to overcome or to destroy 
the prince of princess now the the the, the spirit or, or the power that works behind uh, the roman empire or this little, little horn is the devil himself and then we are also told that this little horn power would take away the daily sacrifice and by daily sacrifice we understand that uh, this refers to the sacrificial system or uh, the sacrifice that the priests had to offer uh, in the uh, in the temple on a daily basis and about this we read in hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 where it says and every priest daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins now this is speaking of the the the, the sacrificial system that was practiced by the by the jews or it was part and parcel of the jewish religious economy <clears throat> so in taking away the daily sacrifice the little horn would cause the sacrificial system to cease and <clears throat> we know when this happened because even after christ was crucified and after he had ascended unto heaven uh, the the jews still practice the sacrificial system they still sacrifice animals on the altar but this practice came to an end in the year 70 AD and <clears throat> and this is uh, this is what this uh, prophecy tells us it tells us that this little horn uh, will not only take away the daily sacrifice but it will also cast down or destroy or destroy or bring down uh, the place of his sanctuary this sanctuary is basically the temple the temple in jerusalem <clears throat> and so this was fulfilled in the year 70 a.d so i shall not go in into detail about all this i think it's clear enough that this little horn power uh, represents none other than the roman empire uh, and so let us go to Daniel chapter 11 now Daniel chapter 11 is the last vision that Daniel received concerning the rise and fall of kingdoms however the major difference between chapter 11 and chapters 2 7 and 8 is that in chapter 11 Daniel no, long, no longer uses symbols as was the case in the three chapters uh, in Daniel chapter 11 we find the mention of real people in other words Daniel 11 speaks of the same things we have discussed so far without the use of symbolical language in fact when you read chapter 11 you will notice that uh, that Daniel uh, was given a more detailed account of the rise and fall of kingdoms and this can be seen so vividly in the following verses where we read and I will show thee the truth Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by this, by and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those so we see here how that this passage is so similar to the one we read earlier uh, in Daniel chapter 8 verse 20 to 22 uh, <clears throat> the question is how does this understanding shed light on the restoration of God's kingdom so this brings us to the heart of the message that I wish to present to you to share with you in this lesson Daniel chapter 2 chapter 7 chapter 8 and 11 can be summed up in the following manner where you see in this image and the on the extreme left is clearly the image of uh, taken from uh, chapter 2 uh, where the four metals correspond with the four animals of Daniel chapter 7 and in chapter 8 and 11 the prophecy begins at the second kingdom uh, of Medo Persia and extends all the way to the fourth and the final kingdom of Rome. All right, now, besides the primary application that the metals and the clay in the first image represent uh, the kingdoms of this world, 
these metals are also synonymous with geography. Metals and clay are mineral resources and we often associate these with the subject of geography. There may be some of you who would not subscribe to this explanation or may find a problem with this reasoning uh, the, because you may bring out the argument that Perhaps the same association that natural resources have with ge geography may not be made by the people living in the days of Daniel. Uh, but let me remind you once again that that the books of Daniel and Revelation were tailor-made to suit the people living in the last days. I'm talking about the prophecies. The prophecies were tailor-made to suit the people living in the last days. This is perhaps one of the reasons why Daniel was not able to completely understand uh, the reason why God gave these visions, you know, one, one vision after the other. These uh, visions were different one from the other. Uh, in Daniel chapter 2, uh, God presented the kingdoms in the form of, uh, of metals. And in chapter, in chapter 7, uh, the same thing is being being shown but this time around uh, God used animals to represent these same kingdoms and the same th and a similar trend we see happening in Daniel chapter 8 and uh, chapters and chapter 11 <clears throat> so basically God was using different methods of revealing the secrets each time a new prophecy was given to Daniel as far as the rise and fall of kingdoms is concerned <clears throat> On this note, it is advisable that we look at the visions of Daniel and Revelation in the context of this age, not in the context of uh, the time that Daniel lived. So the first vision in Daniel chapter 2 mainly speaks of uh, the geographical aspect of the kingdom. Now secondly, the bees of Daniel chapter 7 clearly represent political powers. And it is no surprise that even today, uh, governments around the world uh, in choosing the animals to repre represent them, uh, they essentially wish to identify themselves with the character and the attributes that are closely associated with that animal. And the same was also true with the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon chose uh, a lion to represent the kings of Babylon. So Daniel chapter 7 speaks of the political aspect. Now the third vision of the ram and the he-goat connotes the religious aspect of the kingdom and we can be certain of this because these animals are among some of the animals that were being used in the ceremonial rites of the Jewish economy. So Daniel 8 represents the religious aspect of the kingdom and in Daniel chapter 11 we see the use of real people to describe the events pertaining to the rise and fall of kingdoms. This, however, connotes the de demographical aspect of the kingdom. And when you look at this picture in this, in this manner, uh, it is very interesting to note that these are the very same things. These four things are the very same things that Israel, the people of Israel in the days of Daniel, lost when Nebuchadnezzar invaded and vandalized Jerusalem. Uh, and these are the very same things uh, that were to be restored or were, to, were in the process of being restored after the 70 year of Babylonian captivity came to an end. Now how does this tie in with the restoration of God's kingdom? We have, to, we have to bear in mind that the ancient Israelites were used by God to be a teaching tool to represent the real Israelites born not of flesh and blood but of the spirit. In other words, physical Israel as a nation chosen by God to serve him and to be the depositories of uh, God's truth is a reflection of the spiritual Israel that is God's church in these last days, who are also chosen to serve him and to be the depos depositories of God's word. So the restoration of the geographical, political, religious and demographical aspects of, of the Israelite nation was a typical representation of the restoration that uh, spiritual Israel has to undergo. Alright, now we understand how physical Israel lost its uh, geographical, political, religious and demographic aspects, aspects uh, to the Babylonians. But how and in what way will spiritual 
Israel lose these things and how will these things be restored? Uh, here's what I understand concerning this, this matter. Geographically, we are located in the planet Earth. But remember, we are not of it. God's people are not of this world. Why? Because when God initially created this earth, he did so with the intention that it would be inhabited by righteous beings. But because sin has succeeded in making its entrance into this world, we no longer consider this place our home, in part because this planet has been dominated by sin. And the vast major majority of people living since the fall of man have aligned themselves with the powers of darkness. As a consequence of this, uh, the majority have a more powerful voice in matters concerning the affairs of this world. And therefore, God's people are prone to be persecuted and they are also prone to be driven out of their homes and the properties confiscated. Now, this is the truth. I'm not just making this up. Now, basically what happens is that their right of ownership will be taken away from them. And this world is also so infected by sin and its curses that God's people know for a fact that their real home is one in which there is no sin. Sin has not marred uh, any creation of God. So their home basically is in the earth made new where sin no, lo no longer exists. Uh, <clears throat> so this is what I understand about the geographical aspect of the kingdom. The restoration of the geographical aspect of the kingdom will be fulfilled uh, when <clears throat> God or when Christ recreates this earth. Uh, politically, we have a king who sits at the right hand of God in heaven and our allegiance is to him alone. But as long as we are waiting for the day of deliverance and liberation, we are still under the, the, under the political dominion of the kingdoms and governments of this world. And these are the same powers that will be extensively used by Satan to harass and persecute God's people. Uh, while it is true that we belong to God, it is also true that we are waiting for complete and total deliverance that will come when Jesus comes again the second time. Alright, now how about the religious aspect. Now, as far as the religious aspect is concerned, God's people are bound to lose the religious freedom. Uh, the defiance against God by the ancient Babylonians was manifested in their act of destroying the temple. Uh, the destruction of the temple meant that the Israelites could no longer offer the daily sacrifices to God. In other words, their right to worship was greatly hindered. Though it was true that this did not prevent them from praying and from singing praises to God. A similar trend would be repeated in the last days when the people of God would be disallowed to a great extent to carry on with their usual custom of worshipping their Creator. Those who, dare, but those who dare to defy the dictates and the rules of the state uh, will eventually be persecuted and put to death. So it is in in the process of persecution that God's church will be scattered and many will suffer and even die for the truth. And this is how the demographical aspect of spiritual Israel will be severely affected. But whatever is being said and done, the spiritual restoration of spiritual Israel is currently underway since the time Jesus received the kingdom. And the physical restoration will commence at the second coming and be completed when this earth is made new. That is after the 1000 years of uh, rest that the saints will enjoy in heaven. In realizing that the physical restoration of uh, physical Israel in the days of Daniel represents the restoration of spiritual Israel, I cannot help but come to the conclusion that Cyrus was the type that represented Christ. Now, just how this is the case, I am going to demonstrate it to you. Uh, the Israelites who represented the church or the people of God uh, in being taken captive by Babylon represents the truth that since the fall of uh, since the fall of man, humanity uh, was led captive by sin or was held captive by sin for a period of about 4,000 years. 
So Babylon in this context represents sin. The Babylonian captivity came to a partial end in 539 BC when Cyrus was given the responsibility to besiege and overthrow the great city of Babylon. Now on the same year, the ruler of the Medo-Persian realm was Darius or otherwise known as Xerxes. Cyrus on the other hand was an heir who was yet to ascend unto the throne. Uh, but his position as the king would only be confirmed if only he survived the battle to conquer Babylon and captured it. Survive and conquer he did and his victory meant liberation for the captors of Babylon. And about three years after his, this great victory, Cyrus became the ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire in the year 536 BC. And interestingly, it was on the same year that he passed a decree which paved the way for the process of the restoration of Jerusalem to commence. Now, though this decree was mainly aimed at the religious and demographical restoration of Israel, and that he allowed the Jews to both return to the to the desolate city and to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. It is nonetheless true that the restoration of physical Israel became a reality only when Cyrus finally came to the throne. So it is in realizing this that it is no wonder that God made a special mention of Cyrus in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 1. And this mention was made about 150 or maybe 100 to 200 years before Cyrus was born. Correspondingly, the victory of Christ on Calvary broke the spell of sin that have so long held humanity captive. Because of what Christ had done or what he has achieved at the cross, sin is no longer the problem between God and man. And this is what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now the victory of Christ was, has lifted the curse of sin from humanity, but the full realization of this came when he was glorified, or when Christ received the kingdom from God, or when he received the title of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In giving to his believers the, the very thing that he received from his father the believers were imbued with the same victorious life of Christ and sin could no longer have the kind of dominion that it did prior to the glorification of Christ this is in line with the experience of the Jews in relation to Cyrus's rise to power as uh, as a reminder uh, Cyrus defeated the Babylonian kingdom he besieged and captured the Babylonian kingdom. But, and that spelled liberty for the Jews who, were, who had spent 70 years or almost 70 years uh, <clears throat> in captivity under the Babylonian rule. But the reality of that liberation bore fruit when Cyrus came to power. So, so also it was with Christ. Christ gained the victory over Satan and over sin, over death at the cross. But the reality of that victory came when Christ was glorified and he gave that victorious life to each one of us. So what else do we find in the life of Cyrus that is similar to what we see uh, concerning the gospel of the kingdom? Now, we also find that the decree passed by Cyrus in 536 BC uh, gave all the Jews the opportunity to leave the land of, of captivity and, and therefore be free. However, the vast majority did not heed to the call and what resulted from this was that after Cyrus had passed away and, and other kings took his place, uh, the Jews who remained in Babylon were driven into persecution by the other ru rulers of the Persian kingdom. Uh, the account of Mordecai and the Jews in the days of Esther is a classic exa example of what I am saying. 
Uh, similarly, the message that sin is no longer a barrier between God and man and that freedom from sin is a rea reality if only we choose to believe in what Christ has done for us is also being preached today, but many still fail to heed the message. Because of what? Because of unbelief. Therefore, like many of the Jews who never responded to the opportunity provided by Cyrus, died in captivity and could never taste the freedom that was rightfully theirs, many today are also facing the danger that they may never take the opportunity to be free from sin. And therefore, they live under the shadow that they might even die in their sins and they would never taste the freedom that is already theirs to grasp to have faith to to take the faith that will take hold upon the promise that god has promised to give to those who believe so thus far i have only highlighted the spiritual aspect of the kingdom uh, what about the physical aspect now, as far as the physical kingdom is concerned, the defeat of Babylon in the hands of Cyrus is closely connected with the second coming of Jesus. Uh, though I shall deal with this in greater detail towards the end of the series when I am going to discuss about the fall of spiritual Babylon, for now I would simply say that the entrance of Cyrus and his army to liberate the Israelites is a typical representation of Christ coming in the clouds of heaven along with the angelic beings to take all the sins of God to heaven and liberate them from the persecuting powers of Satan. Now I shall discuss this as I have said more in, in, in greater detail uh, when I do the book of Revelation. That is when I come to the end, towards the end of this series. So you shall see why this is the case. Now ancient Jer Jerusalem that was made new corresponds with the heavenly city of New Jer Jerusalem that the people of God are destined to inherit. Further, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem is in a way a representation of the demographical restoration of spiritual Israel, which points to the restoration of the spiritual temple of God. And by spiritual temple, I mean that God's church is likened in the Bible to the temple not made with hands, where the members themselves are the stones that constitute the spiritual building where God dwells by His Spirit. So when all the people of God are finally gathered together in the clouds of heaven to live for all eternity, it represents the complete and final demographic restoration of the kingdom of heaven. So this is what I want to share with you in this lesson. Uh, I seriously and sincere, sincerely hope uh, that you understand and grasp, and grasp uh, what I am sharing with you today. If you have any questions or doubts, please feel free to express them in the comments below. And I shall try and <clears throat> and, and give you a, a, a explanation to, to your questions and your queries. Uh, so this, is, uh, this lesson pretty much concludes our study of the book of Daniel. And... And in the next lesson, we shall move on to the book of Revelation. And we shall see there is so much to learn in the book of Revelation. And you and you immediately you will see that the book of Revelation is inextricably connected to the book of Daniel. And so I shall see you again in the next lesson. Till then, may God be with you. Amen.